Hello, everyone. I'm Jim Garrison. I want to welcome you to this session of Humanity Rising as we convene our fourth of five sessions uh, on the conflict uh, in Ukraine. Over the last several days, we have seen uh, for the first time uh, since the war began some movement uh, in the area of negotiation. As Xi Jinping, the leader of China, has been talking to Vladimir uh, Zelensky, the president of Ukraine, uh, in some interchanges uh, that have begun at least a discussion about what a peace process uh, might entail. The Chinese put forward a peace proposal some months ago uh, that was uh, welcomed by the Russians, uh, rejected by the United States and Ukraine, uh, but Xi Jinping uh, has persisted. Uh, and that is an important synchronicity for our program today, uh, because uh, today we want to focus on the whole domain of negotiation. You know, what happens when two or more conflicting parties that are killing each other on the battlefield, what happens when a process that brings forth a ceasefire takes place? How does it take place? And what are the principles that govern the cessation of lethal conflict? So we're gonna have uh, several people who've been involved in conflict resolution and in negotiation uh, for many, many years uh, to discuss this very grave and, and also potentiated matter uh, with us today. Uh, and so I wanna welcome you uh, to this discussion. And I'd like to also uh, welcome Jody Evans, the uh, co-founder of uh, Code Pink with Medea Benjamin and, and other uh, women uh, many decades ago, who's a co-moderator with me. And we're partnering, we're very privileged to be co-partnering uh, with Code Pink, these uh, summits on Ukraine. So Jody, a welcome and would love to have you make whatever comments you would like as we begin. Thank you, Jim, and good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us. And I'm very excited for this um, morning because um, at Code Pink, our work has been for the last over a year to call for diplomacy, that um, it's how wars end. And a few weeks ago, uh, there was a hearing and Blinken, the Secretary of State was uh, talking to Congress about the more needs for more weapons. And Medea Benjamin, my partner disrupted him and said, your job is to be a diplomat, be a diplomat. And she was dragged out of the room and arrested. Um, so last night, oh, she also asked him as they were dragging her out of the room, she said, if you don't like China's peace plan, come up with one of your own. Um, last night, she saw Nancy Pelosi at the Goldman Prize Awards and very seriously went up to the Congresswoman and said, we need peace. You need to work with Biden. We need negotiations. We need diplomacy. And Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi turned around and looked at her and said, no, we don't need diplomacy. We need a victory. So, you know, just like Jim said, you know, watching these conversations between Zelensky and President Xi, and now this conversation we see, as we've been talking about, you know, in these summits, that the goal of the United States is to um, have a victory over Russia. Now, that's all while the generals are telling us this is a stalemate, there's no chance for victory, and it will go on for a very, very long time. And what that means, you know, after we heard it from Chris yesterday, you know, what war really looks like, we don't get to see. And Chris gave us an inkling of that, you know, because you can only take in so much. But the fact that we can have leaders that talk so, I want to say insanely, about war, instead of the concern for life, is what to listen with today, because you know diplomacy is what ends war. And now we have these amazing men to, to share with us 
what that process is, because that's what we need to, both with our hearts and with our energies and with our, our own lives, be working for right now. So thank you for joining us this morning. And thank you, uh, Jody, for that uh, story between uh, uh, Medea and Nancy Pelosi. It brings in the very stark relief uh, the challenges that we have, uh, particularly here in the United States, to even talk about peace in a meaningful way uh, within the context of a united leadership that wants war uh, in Washington. And therein lies the conundrum of bringing peace uh, in a time of war. Uh, before we dive into this uh, domain more fully uh, with our guests today, let us just pause as we always do on Humanity Rising and try with just simple breathing uh, to bring peace uh, within. So in a moment, you'll hear the sound of a bell. When you hear that bell, just breathe in very slowly for about five and a half seconds. Then you'll hear the sound of another bell and just breathe out uh, for five and a half seconds. And we're gonna take 10 conscious, coherent breaths together. And then we'll begin our program. Thank you, everyone, and welcome to Humanity Rising. Thank you, everyone. We began the week with uh, a discussion of citizen diplomacy. And we explored the notion and the historical reality that oftentimes when the governments are in their most conflicted state, when they're at war, either a hot war or a cold war, Citizens, non-state actors can have a powerful effect in bringing light to a dark situation, uh, breaking through the polarized perspectives that lead to war, uh, and actually creating a pathway uh, toward peace. It's happened many times in history uh, where people from what Joe Montville of the State Department called track two diplomacy have been instrumental in bringing peace uh, to many kinds of situations, not just uh, nation states uh, at war. Uh, and today we're uh, equally privileged as we were on Monday with Jim Hickman and Harriet Crosby. Uh, Jody is a citizen diplomat in her own right uh, to have uh, two uh, citizen diplomats who've been in 
the area of conflict resolution and negotiation uh, for many, many decades. I am also very proud to say that they're both dear and very old friends of mine, as uh, has been Jim uh, and Harriet. Uh, there was a number of us uh, back in the 1970s, 1980s, uh, who came together uh, really around the Esalen Soviet American Exchange Program and the work that Esalen was doing in the Soviet Union, uh, and have been fast friends ever since, supporting one another, uh, each of us uh, working in various domains of endeavor, uh, but staying in touch from time to time and collaborating all around uh, this notion that in a time of nuclear danger, in a time when the world is globalizing at every conceivable level, it is possible for us humans uh, to create a world of peace where we respect diversity and we honor differences and we uh, work collaboratively to melt the hatred and the fear and the prejudice uh, that has separated uh, humans and societies and even civilizations uh, for so many centuries uh, in our uh, very long history. So today I want to welcome uh, first John Marx, uh, who uh, was uh, the founder of Search for Common Ground out of the hot tubs of uh, Esalen Institute, where we used to gather back in 1982, uh, which he uh, ran uh, for uh, uh, four decades to 2014. And, and now he's uh, with his wife, Susan Collin Marx, uh, living in Amsterdam and uh, is uh, heading up uh, another organization, Confluence uh, International. Uh, he works as a peace uh, building consultant at Leiden University. Uh, he, in addition to working in conflict, as the name implies, search for common ground, uh, he has also uh, done uh, 20 or 30 uh, media productions on what peace can mean in areas of conflict. Uh, and also Mark Gerzon, who like John has been working tirelessly uh, through his um, organization, uh, Mediators uh, Foundation, and uh, also uh, a number of books on how you bring uh, resolution through uh, conflict. Uh, and he's worked with the US Congress. Uh, and if you, I can't imagine a more polarized uh, area of politics than the U.S. Congress, but uh, Mark Gerzon uh, is one of the few people out there that has actually gotten into that thicket and brought um, people who, in under any other circumstances, would be at each other's throats uh, to weekend seminars where they actually realize that they uh, have much more in common than they actually do uh, in difference. So both these gentlemen uh, are seasoned, uh, but they're consistent with Jim Hickman and Harriet Crosby and, and others, Jody, have been working in politics, but from a vantage point outside uh, politics, uh, and that is the domain of citizen uh, diplomacy. So, John, Mark, thank you for your decades of work in this uh, field, and I want to uh, uh, start with you, uh, John. And uh, just talk to us about the foundation of uh, Search for Common Ground and, and then just detail some of the areas of conflict that you've engaged in and some of the things that you've learned. And then, Mark, similarly uh, from you uh, when uh, John is done. And then we're going to uh, talk about some of the principles that you've learned. And then finally, we'll turn uh, to the question of some recommendations you might have about Ukraine. John, I know you've written a whole paper on that, which I've read. Uh, and uh, so, John, uh, tell us about the uh, founding of Search and some of the the adventures you've had over the years in bringing yeah. peace. I could go on for a long time, but the short answer is I was very much an adversarial opponent of the Vietnam War and then of the abuses of the government and the CIA. Um, I worked for U.S. Senator Clifford Case, and I was a principal legislative person on the Case Church Amendment, which actually cut off the funding to the war. 
And I was adversarial to my core at that point. And I came to a conclusion, I guess in the mid seventies, that uh, I was being defined by what I was against. And I wanted to be for things, not against, rather than to tear down the system um, or throw monkey wrenches into the system, which I'd become rather adept at. What I wanted to do was to build a new system. And to, rather than being against, I wanted to be for something, the building of that. And I founded Search uh, uh, really in the hot tubs of Esla, as Jim mentioned. Um, uh, the basic of epiphanies that allowed me to make the shift from kind of uh, conflict causer to peace re resolver were made at Esalen. And I'm very grateful for what I learned from uh, Jim Hickman, Jim Garrison, Michael Murphy, and the gang, because they provided me the base, which I use later on. And I built Search from Common Ground from an organization with zero people, in other words, I was the only employee for a while, to an organization of 600 people with offices in 35 countries. And we did lots of things over the years in the peace building area. Uh, in, uh, between Jordan and Israel, we brought together uh, retired generals from both sides who were able to um, come up with what became the essence of the peace treaty between Jordan and Israel. In Burundi, I think we played a profound part in preventing the country from going genocidal as it had happened in Rwanda next door. And in each one of those countries, uh, I think we made a difference. And one of the things I learned over the years is that you don't make peace with your friends. In other words, you have to, uh, let us say, be willing not to judge who's right and who's wrong in the conflict. Obviously we have a, people like me have a personal opinion on who's the bad guy and who's the good guy. But if you let that influence you, you're not gonna get anywhere. And you can't make peace by favoring one side or the other, or you can't be a mediator if you favor one side. And so uh, I, I could give you lots of more examples but those are some of the lessons I've learned. And I've just finished a book that's getting into more of them. Oh, look forward to hearing more about it. We can have you back on Humanity Rising, just about your book and your, your adventures. Uh, thank you, uh, John. It's a good start. Mark, uh, tell us about how you kind of got into this domain. Well, thank you, Jim. First, I want to say it's a delight to be with my heroes here on this call. John is one of my heroes. Jody is one of my heroes. Scylla Elworthy, who is not with us this morning, is one of my heroes. So there, I have heroes in this field. So um, uh, I wrote a book once about men in masculinity called A Choice of Heroes. And um, my heroes are on this call. So um, thank you for including me. Um, I think the beginning for me, and I love the way John put it, because I, I think a lot of us started as passionate warriors. Uh, believing in something and and being against things, I was a draft resistor against the Vietnam War, and um, and you know from that point on, and I looked at what we were accomplishing uh, as being conflict causers, joining the conflict, as our colleague William Urey says, being on one of the two sides, and I thought you know it's not working very well. Uh, maybe you know we did, it took us a long time to stop the Vietnam War, and one could argue that we never stopped it, despite all the things we did, risking going to jail. Um, so yeah, I, I also became a, a kind of a passionate believer in mediation and uh, started Mediators Foundation in the 70s, uh, not long after John started. What year did you start Search for Common Ground, John? 1982. 82. So about the same time. Yeah, I started Mediators about the same time. And uh, and I think the, 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 the spirit that, I mean, that was early 80s, that was, you know, the nuclear weapons were pointed at each other between the Soviet Union and the United States. And I think many of us, including you, Jim, were galvanized by that fact. And uh, I happened to be working then as a filmmaker in Hollywood and, you know, started a company, Mediators Productions, was started to build, create films and projects, uh, which is something that John has pioneered, you know, to, to bridge the divide. And so we brought Soviets to Hollywood and Hollywood people to Moscow to, quote, end the Cold War on the big screen. And I think that was a period that formed some of my thinking, which was 
uh, as John said, you don't make friends with your, you don't make make peace with your friends. And I spent a lot of time in the Soviet Union um, and realized, you know, there were people there that wanted peace and then brought the artists together who made films with the artists who made films in Hollywood and, and said to them, are you want to be propagandists or artists? You know, I mean, do you want to be propagandists or artists? And if you're artists, then make films that are that are real and true. You know, so we were fighting disinformation 30 years ago. Um, and I I can't do a quick history of the past 30 years. But as you said, I uh, after the end of the Cold War, it was pretty clear to me that some of the animosity that was focused on the Soviet Union started to turn inward in America. And I noticed a lot of internal conflict starting in the early 90s. So I did shift my focus to the conflict inside the U.S. Um, and I guess the, the last thing I'll share, uh, many things that I could share, but I, I want to just say that I was thinking of Jody mentioning Medea Benjamin. The two books that I was reading this week were both very tiny books. One was Medea Benjamin's War in Ukraine, and the other was Tom Paine's Common Sense. And before I pass the baton back to you, uh, Jim, or to Jody, I just want to say, learn something from reading Tom Paine's Common Sense. He has a beautiful section in there where he says, he argues against monarchy. Um, and his eloquent argument against monarchy says, why would we raise one person for hereditary reasons over everyone else? He says, monarchy diminishes everyone else. And so he was against monarchy. And um, I just want to say that, you know, reading that, I realized one of the thoughts I'd like to have come up in this next hour is America still seems to think that we are the superpower, that we need to be preeminent over all over other countries. And I was thinking if Tom Paine were here today, he would say, wait a minute, my argument against monarchy would be the same thing against American supremacy. Um, mm -hmm. That when one country says we're the peacekeeper, we're the biggest, we're the best, we're the ones who's going to hold the world together, it diminishes every other country. And uh, I'll leave that thought and then pass it over to Jody. Yeah, Jody, in that spirit, tell us, uh, you know, how you got uh, Code Pink together with Medea and others. What was that uh, originating impulse? Oh, well, we had come together as unreasonable women after Diane Wilson had done a talk at Bioneers and said, we all, we need to all be unreasonable women. And um, Bush was using the color-coded alerts, orange, red, and yellow, to frighten the American people into war. So we flew to Washington, D.C. and said, code pink for peace, and have been standing in Washington, D.C., disrupting power ever since. Um, but I want to, the common sense piece, and, and welcome, welcome, Mark and John, thank you so much for being here, my heroes, because diplomacy is how we get to peace, diplomacy is how we end war. Um, common sense is now being manufactured, um, and it has been, it's a construct, because if we had common sense, we wouldn't, we would know there's no victory in war, there's only losing in war. I mean, that for Nancy Pelosi to say victory misses what really happens. If we had common sense, um, like Mark said, we would know that you know one thing on top is not a good idea, especially when we banter around the word democracy. Um, and we're watching that this war on Ukraine is shifting the powers in the world because the rest of the world is seeing that, but the people inside the United States are not. So yes, if we could go back to Thomas Paine and actually find our way back to our own common sense, but too many people in the United States, their common sense has been manufactured and it has been weaponized for war and has is, is be become a, a, a tool for war because it's been built around them and built around them and built around them and they don't know their way out. And to try to disrupt that, uh, the psyche feels it as a as a disturbance, as a painful disturbance instead of a liberation. So um, here we are in this moment of history where diplomacy is so needed. I'd, I'd love to hear from both of you. When you look at this moment in history, what do you, where do you wish you could throw yourself in? <laughs> because you have so many tools. And I know people with tools love to be able to exercise them. John? 
Where would you throw yourself in? That's a great question, Jody. Where would you throw yourself in right now, John? In the Ukrainian situation, uh, I wouldn't. Uh, the kind of work we do, uh, the kind of track two work works much better before a conflict um, comes into being, before it turns violent. Uh, the time for having done this for people like us was three years ago, five years ago, and the like. Uh, but once the people start shooting each other, the feelings get too high, the need for revenge on both sides, uh, the need for victory. I would add to what um, Jody said about Nancy Pelosi, that if you talk to a Russian leader, you would have gotten exactly the same reaction. And that can't probably can't be overcome by track two diplomacy. Um, I wrote my articles mostly before this conflict broke out. But I don't, I mean, I actually do have an answer on what could be done, but it doesn't involve citizen diplomats at this point. Oh, interesting. Mark, what would you say? Well, first of all, I just want to make sure that uh, John's, your article gets put in the chat or circulated in some way. I haven't read it and I want to read it. Uh, thank you for writing it. Um, well, I'm struck by the fact, I mean, I totally agree with what John said. Um, it's very hard. The work that I did with the United Nations was usually. Uh, after a conflict to try to make sure the conflict did not return, resume. Um, so when, he's, you know, John's absolutely right. When people are shooting each other, you, it's very hard to do this kind of work. The only thing I can imagine doing, and I'd welcome feedback on that is, and I've explored it a little bit is, there's probably a million Russians who've left Russia. And there's two millions Ukrainians who've left Ukraine. And there's 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 millions of refugees from this conflict already. And um, I, I've read interviews with them and met a few of them, and I am so moved by them, all of them. Uh, they tend to be young. They tend to be idealistic and they're lovers of peace. And they're basically like those of us on the phone uh, on this Zoom call. Um, they want peace and they've risked their lives and they've left their homes because they've said, I don't want to be a part of this. Now, in the case of Ukraine, they left because you know, they were bombed out of their homes. But the Russians left because they were against the war. And and uh, I wrote a long letter to Putin that was published basically saying, listen to your young. Listen to your young. They're telling you something about the future of your country. Now, we weren't listened to during the Vietnam War by, by Nixon and his colleagues. And of course, they're not being listened to by Putin and his colleagues. But that's the only thing I can imagine throwing myself into now, Jody, would be somehow or other working with these refugees and imagining and letting the people in Russia and Ukraine know that the people who've left their countries for the different reasons are now in Istanbul and in and and uh, uh, across Europe and 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 they're starting to meet and they're starting to work for a new future that's the only imagine thing i can imagine happening while the shots are being fired and and to go back to john's point when we've tried to do this the feelings are still very high amongst those refugees, very high, particularly the Ukrainian refugees. So it, it, even that is it, hard to do. Well, there was diplomacy happening for what, five years, the, the Minsk Accords. Why, why do you think those didn't work? Um, have you looked closely enough to see because that, that diplomacy was happening, it had been working, it had been holding the peace together um, until the, you know, NATO started to move closer. Um, do you think maybe the it needed more people there? It needed more brokers. Did we not take it seriously enough? How do we, how does one get ahead of war? Because that's what we're saying right now about China, is that you know you can't start a war once it's started, except maybe in the first few days. Um, and that didn't happen because we couldn't get the United States to sit at the table. But right now, um, as the United States is trying to you know, push a war on China, um, is the time for diplomacy is what I'm hearing from you. Well, I do think it's the time for diplomacy and I would put out the best idea that I've heard about in the last few months. And that came from Stephen Walt of Harvard who has said, he wrote an article in Foreign Policy in which he has said that the way that this war could be ended might be if the United States and China 
got into a joint mediating effort because unfortunately both are on, are involved as participants from a distance, but both are involved as participants on both sides. And if they were to come together and jointly try to end this thing, um, that might make a difference. And there's some precedent for that in the Middle East. Uh, there's some two of the wars between Israel and its Arab neighbors uh, were ended pretty much by joint Soviet American efforts, where they came on together with a shared interest. And the fact that China and the United States do share an interest, which is that um, ending the war would be in the interest of both countries, despite what we're hearing. Um, that might be the only way I can think in the near term uh, that anything's going to happen. Uh, unfortunately, wars tend to end when one side gets exhausted or is defeated. And we seem to be headed toward a stalemate inside Ukraine. So I think if there is not a massive mediation effort, that nothing is going to happen. And having it come from a joint US-Chinese uh, direction might just make a huge difference. I, unfortunately, I don't think Stephen Waltz, or, though I believe Stephen Waltz about the wisest of the establishment thinkers in, in this country at this point, um, I don't think his idea has been picked up upon by either the Biden administration or the Chinese administration. And, and that what John is proposing or what Waltz is proposing would be an incredible confidence building measure because imagine if China and the U.S. did that together, um, mm -hmm. that would be a great step towards some kind of a different energy between the two. And, and right now, I'm glad you brought that up, Jody, because um, it's very hard. It's, we, we didn't stop the Ukraine war. Uh, the Chinese war can be stopped. And that, that Chinese-U.S. war can be stopped. And, and I think asking that question, and Jim, in this series, exploring that a little more in greater depth would be a good idea. Because there's no excuse for the passivity, except, you know, I just want to bring up the issue of disinformation. I was recently in a meeting at the Hewlett Foundation. The Hewlett Foundation is spending tens of millions of dollars on fighting disinformation. And we do live in a new era now where it's very hard for like an article like the one that John is mentioning. An article like that 30 years ago was in a different media space than mm -hmm. it is today. Uh, today, there's a tsunami of disinformation that's washing across the, 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 the landscape. And so you have a powerful, thoughtful article like that, and it just doesn't register the way it might have 20 or 30 years ago. Yeah, I mean, that's worth uh, uh, just picking up on uh, for a moment, uh, you know, because I think uh, the reality of the dis so-called disinformation, I think, is also due to the fact that the public, uh, not only in the United States, but around the world, have increasingly distrusted government and official sources. You know, it used to be 30, 40 years ago, the people basically believed their governments and basically believed in the institutions. Uh, and then, you know, I think really starting in Vietnam, the government, you know, proactively lied to the American people and, and did so so consistently that the erosion of public confidence in the prevailing institutions has given rise to a, a plethora of just different points of view. Uh, and so the, this issue of disinformation is really a matter of wh wh what's your perspective on what disinformation uh, really is, and, and to bring it back to diplomacy, to your question earlier, uh, Jody, about the Minsk Accords, uh, you know, it's it, 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 what turned out to be happening with the Minsk Accords, according to Medea Benjamin in her book, uh, and uh, even the interviews that uh, Angela Merkel made and, and others who were uh, intimately involved in that, is it was a ruse. They were playing for time. And the, the Russians entered into the Minsk Accords in good faith, but it turned out that what was happening is they were stringing 
the negotiations out while the United States and NATO were arming the Ukrainians uh, to the point where they felt that the Minsk Accords were no longer um, effective or needed. And then they, they were abruptly uh, dispensed with. And it was in the aftermath of that that Putin uh, uh, invaded Ukraine to seize the land bridge to uh, Crimea. So diplomacy at that state level can also be a ruse uh, in the in kind of the game of thrones uh, between the nations. And that's why uh, having authentic citizen diplomacy uh, in these uh, occasions uh, is uh, so critical and it didn't happen with Ukraine. I don't know of any citizen diplomacy that was taking place. It was more the state actors in their uh, machinations uh, that that ended up in the in the conflict and the escalating mess that we're in. Uh, and you know, it was within that context, John, I'd like to go back to because I remember this when you were doing it. Uh, with uh, Israel and Jordan, because here you have a situation where there was both Cold War and Hot War taking place between the parties. Um, and you were able, Search was able to come into that complexity and really make a, 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 a difference. So I I want to challenge just a little bit this notion that when the war begins, citizen diplomacy has no more utility because I think there are many occasions um, where citizen diplomacy has worked and can work even in the midst of real uh, real conflict. And, and, and your experience with Israel and Jordan, I think is one of those occasions, unless I'm not remembering, occasion, uh, remembering accurately. So take a, a few minutes and just tell us that story. Okay. Uh, I don't think that, I mean, I know that Israel and Jordan were not shooting at each other when we were working. Yeah, well, at we that had time. Been, well, yeah. yeah, but they hadn't been shooting at each other for about 10 years at least. Um, and so that made a big, big difference. And both yeah, yeah. sides had an interest in doing something. We set up a forum where we built trust with both sides. We'd been working with generals from Israel or retired ones from Israel and Jordan, but we had the, the approval of the top level. We, um, we had been to see everybody from Yasser Arafat uh, to Rabin uh, to the Crown Prince of Jordan. And we had the political approval of everyone on both sides. I mean, the leaders on both sides to do a track two process. And usually often you can't do track two unless track one at least is not hostile. In other words, there probably needs to be some support. I think in US Soviet days, uh, on, at least on the Soviet side, we had a tacit approval, which you were seeing um, Gorbachev, you were seeing people around Gorbachev. They weren't fighting you. If they had been fighting you or they had been at war, it probably wouldn't have worked. There wouldn't have been the space to do the work. So we had the trust because we've been working in the region at that point for about 10 years already. And we knew the people and they were willing to come. And we used facilitation and um, we had the meetings in nice European cities. Uh, you don't wanna have a meeting in January in Helsinki and invite people from the Middle East to come along. So we did that too. Uh, you, what you need to do is set up a, a, a create a space within which people who have at least the ear of the leadership can come. What we were able to do was get a, a, a series of agreements between the Jordanian and Israeli generals, which were getting back to the top leadership, to the King of Jordan and to the Prime Minister of Israel within 24 hours. The, the moment was ripe and the channel worked and the like. And to recreate that in another country is a whole different kettle of fish. It can be done, uh, mm -hmm. but it's not the same. And But having a safe space 
where people feel comfortable to talk, to try out ideas, and to exchange ideas is probably key to the whole business. Yeah, and just to tease that out and then love your comment, Mark and, and Jody, uh, what, you're, what John is saying, if I understand you, John, is there's a couple of necessary preconditions to uh, the work that, that uh, a citizen diplomat would do, that there are needs in the first instance to be some kind of tacit, even if it's completely unofficial and hidden, approval of the governmental parties, in this case, uh, between the PLO and Israel and Jordan. So you, And that's true about the work we were doing with the, 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 the Soviet Union back in the in the 80s, you know, um, it wouldn't it was have... just it was more true from the Soviet side than the American side. Yeah, yeah, but but nevertheless, there was a there needs to be a, 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 an approved vacuum within which the citizen dipl diplomat, even though they're given very limited parameters, can begin um, uh, their work. And then the second kind of necessary precondition is the willingness of the parties, um, uh, even though, again, very unofficially, quietly, uh, secretly, uh, even to begin the process of meeting, you know, on neutral ground, uh, to begin the process uh, of exploration. Because um, this is really the point of this uh, exercise now is to get from, you know, really the three of you, you know, what are the principles that that are 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 necessary to uh, have in place and the principles that are then effectuated. Um, so, uh, Mark, me, what do you add yeah, to that? Yeah, let me let me comment on that because I think a principle that I would have that I would recommend people think about is what's the system of which the conflict is a part. There's been a lot of writing. Well, I learned this first from the mayor of a, an Israeli town called Neve Shalom. Who I, you know, I said to him, you know, many years ago, what's what's why is this conflict so intractable? And he said, think of two boxers in the ring who are fighting, that all the people in the stadium have bets on the fighters. So yeah, it's the fighters who are in the ring, but all the people outside the ring who are betting on it are part of it too. So there have recently been articles about Sudan saying, you know, look at all the protagonists who have an interest in what happens in Sudan. And I had a personal experience of this facilitating for the UN in Nepal shortly after the Nepali civil war, where painstakingly we got the seven major political parties together. And, and it was a six, amazing feat to get all seven of them together into a palace and, and for three days to really talk about, okay, how do we make sure this violence ends? How do we begin to work together as political parties as one country? And I was, you know, very proud of my colleagues at the UN who had managed to get all seven political parties there. And I was the facilitator for the meeting. And it was only halfway through the meeting that I started to understand the obvious um, because I was not very well versed in the region's politics, which is that one of the parties was basically controlled by China. And the other part, another party was basically controlled by India. So the notion that we had the whole system there because we had seven parties was wrong. We didn't have the whole system there. We needed to have China and India, <laughs> but we didn't have China and India. And so going back to Ukraine, you know, um, Ukraine, like as like the Israeli mayor said, it's it's a battleground for, for two superpowers. And each of those superpowers have a story in their heads about who they should be in the world. Putin has a story about Russian empire, and the United States has a, a story about being the peacekeeping, quote unquote, peacekeeping superpower for the world. Those stories are in direct conflict. And so this is this is the conundrum for me after 30, 40 years in this field is we have to deal with consciousness, not just politics. <laughs> we have to deal with consciousness. And when people hold stories uh, in their heads that, at least from my point of view, both the Soviet and American stories are, are, are not true. Um, I, don't, I don't believe Putin's story about Russia's destiny, and I don't believe America's story about being the preeminent superpower. But when people hold those stories, we're dealing with a very deep and sinister force, and it's very hard to transform that in the middle of a conflict. But if I were to be able to wave my magic wand, I would, I would get a great filmmaker, 
I've got a great filmmaker doing work in Russia and in the United States. I would have the filmmaker capture story, just basically what Thich Nhat Hanh said. You know, Thich Nhat Hanh, when he said, how do you resolve a conflict? He said, go to one side, listen to their suffering and tell the other side about their side suffering. And then go to that side, listen to their suffering and tell the other side about theirs. I would change the word suffering to story. And I would expose the two stories in the same film and then basically end with a distinguished group of people saying, those two stories are leading us, as Jody said, look, those two stories are leading us to this, uh, this senseless conflict. Um, it's time to dismantle those two stories and find peace and make it so that people hold those stories no longer are infatuated with themselves, but instead say, oh, well, that's just a story I'm holding. Yeah, I've got to rethink that. Because when both of them are put in the same film, then and if somebody watches that film, oh, oh, I okay. And people start to feel. And John's been a John's been a John and the search have been a brilliant advocate mm -hmm. for years of the power of both fiction and nonfiction storytelling on the screen. Or and and uh, maybe John, you could say another word, or Jody, say a word about because Jody had a long history in in Hollywood too. Uh, what's is there a way of in, um, dismantling those stories uh, so that we can bring some peace? Well, that's what we try to do at Code Pink, and that's why Medea wrote the book. It's like realizing that you know the common sense that i call it you know the, this manufactured common sense or this story that people don't even understand they live in that doesn't make sense um and and a, a big example of that is um the united states going to war on china and telling everyone that um china is about to bomb taiwan and you know people in china and the people in taiwan are like china is not going to bomb itself Taiwan is China. It's not going to bomb itself. It's a story made up by the United States. And the Taiwanese back channel to Biden this week, you have got to stop this because you are terrorizing the people of Taiwan. But not only that, all our investors are leaving because they think there's going to be a war in Taiwan. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the people that were like, the U.S. was supposed to be showing up as peacemakers for that are going, stop, this doesn't work. We don't want to be Ukraine. But I think that goes back to what do we do here listening to you is that dismantling of the stories ourselves because we watched the Ukraine war be driven almost in a cartoon sense. You had Superman Zelensky against, you know, the devil Putin which has no complexity in it, no humanity in it, distortion on steroids, and how to pull everyone out of those stories into mm -hmm. the complexity of what's happening, what's actually happening, and that they're killing people. I mean, I think for me, it's that, you know, peace is killing people, but Biden has believed that, you know, since the first, first Gulf War. He arrested me the day, um, he presented the war in Iraq to the, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and said, we have to bomb Iraq to peace. And when I told him that was insane, he arrested me. But that concept, very um, imperialistic concept that someone could have, because you have to have it distanced from life. Because if you care about life, even building a bomb is, is, going to be painful. But to think about putting young people against each other and killing each other in these horrific, horrific ways. Now, one country is sending depleted uranium missiles to Ukraine. Um, I think Britain, um, where the devastation is generations long of deformed births. And so it's, there's, we've been able to be distanced from the real costs of war, and then we don't even understand that we're locked in, like you say, these stories. And so at this moment, citizen diplomacy is helping people dismantle themselves from the stories so they, they can change that field. And making a movie would be amazing if it didn't take years to make a movie. <laughs> well, John, you made 20 or 30 movies. And I think Mark's raising a really important uh, point around consciousness and story. Thank you, Mark. But John, I mean, you're the master here of 
storytelling on the screen, um, uh, what would be your comment? And maybe you could give some examples because you've done some really compelling uh, 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 films uh, yeah. over the years. Well, first, uh, I don't think the documentaries in which the two sides put out what's going on really make much of a difference. People don't watch them and they tend to be boring. And we, over the years, have concentrated on drama and fiction, which has themes of uh, social change, which has themes of conflict resolution, of overcoming religious and ethnic hatreds and the like. So not have I, I've, I've actually made over 500 episodes of what I call soap opera for social change in over 20 countries. And um, we, we used a format, and again, this is probably not applicable to the Ukrainian situation. I don't, I don't wanna say that I know how to do one that would bring peace there, but I think what you can do over the long run is change attitudes and behaviors toward particular social issues. Uh, we saw it in the United States with um, 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 the thing with Archie Bunker. Um, All in the uh, family. All in the All family. In the family, which changed, I think, had probably more impact on attitudes towards bias and prejudice than virtually anything that um, has ever been done before or after. And that was a model for us. And also the repetition is important by having a 13 or a 26 part series, uh, you have characters that come into a living room week after week. And so when they say that LGBTQ behavior is okay, or the character who you who most people thought was a sympathetic, wonderful person turns out to be gay, that has more of an impact than saying you should respect um, certain people or not respect them. In other words, by using drama, you're able to change attitudes and behaviors in a way that I don't think you can with other forms of uh, film. And Mark, over the years, convened US and Soviet filmmakers who made dramatic films, and that made a real difference, it seemed to me. Uh, and in fact, that was one of my models when I got started. But uh, so, that's how I've done it. I know we made one feature film over the year and we made a few documentaries, but the thing I'd like to be remembered for would be so proper for social change. Well, John, I, just, <laughs> yeah, I want to agree with John on that one too, that uh, I, I currently am working and have a mini series floating around in Hollywood because I agree with John, a story is better than a documentary. Um, ha having said that though, I want to say that with the Entertainment Summit, um, what we did in the in the 80s, we took the ways that they had portrayed Americans in their films, and we crystallized it down into a three-minute clip reel showing what their stereotype of Americans looked like. And then we did a, a similar film showing the American stereotypes of Soviets and, and took it down to a three-minute clip reel. And those two polarized clip reels ended up on CBS Evening News and many of the major networks because they, they, they crave images. And the images showed very distinctly what the anti-Soviet stereotype was in America and the anti-American stereotype was in the Soviet Union. So I do think there's a, a role for that kind of um, sharp, quote, documentary type style filmmaking. Ultimately, a, a counter story is better, is it one of the best ways to challenge a story than, and then a documentary. I, I unfortunately need to leave on the hour, but I wanted to give uh, Martin Luther King the closing word because going back to, I think, you know, Jody, you, you, you and, and Jim, you were both questioning the word victory and saying, is it really victory we want? And I, I, I never, I, I still feel humbled by the fact that when Martin Luther King was sitting in the Birmingham jail, he said, our goal is not victory, but reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And and, 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 and of course, you can quote Mandela or anybody else too, but I'll just stick with King and say, what incredible um, consciousness it would take to be in jail, having been thrown in jail, and to say our goal is not victory, but reconciliation. And that's, that's the spirit, I think, Jody and Jim, that you are convening this session on. And I, I just want to say I, I really am grateful to both of you. Uh, and I think more needs to be done on this. And, and I, I'm grateful to have been a part of it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. 
Uh, you're doing such great work out there, and uh, we'll have you back uh, down the road uh, because this these issues around resolving conflict in the spirit of reconciliation, not victory, I think is key to any pathway to peace. I think that's that's I, the bottom line that I think we can all agree on, and and uh, so thank you for all your good work on that uh, domain. A pleasure being with all of you, and and, and please continue the conversation. And uh, and I, I I stand by your side. Thank <laughs> you, Mark. Thank you so much for all you do. Take care. Thanks, Mark. So, John, let's uh, let's uh, go a little bit uh, deeper into your your experience and uh, I would say lessons learned having worked in so many domains of conflict, uh, not only political conflict, but social conflict. I remember uh, when Search brought people on both sides of the abortion debate together, for example. So you've, you've dealt with the, the conflict in more dimensionality than almost anybody I personally know. And so I'd love to just uh, hear from you, uh, you know, what, what, what have you learned about the nature of conflict uh, and the, 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 the ways that one can begin to uh, bring people together who uh, in any other circumstance would be, you know, fighting to be, toward victory uh, uh, on each side? Well, let me start by saying I don't think that conflict or violence is an intellectual process. In other words, people don't kill each other because of their ideas. They kill each other because of strong emotional responses. And wow. that's a very that's, huge yes. difference. Uh, wanting to be right, wanting to be first, wanting to be strong. All those impulses come in. Uh, fear of the other, fear of being weak. All that is very much a part of it. And we're seeing that played out in spades right now in Ukraine. Neither side wants to give an inch because that would be a loss of somehow uh, national sovereignty or, or whatever. I mean, they, they, they're just, they're into this. And until that stops, it's going to be very hard to end the war. Um, I think a basic principle of resolving conflict is deep commitment to the resolution. In other words, I don't think you can parachute into a conflict and have much of an impact. Um, the work you, Jim, did in the Soviet Union took years to set up. And you had, I remember going to Moscow with you and you would have a thick, like uh, a binder this thick of names of people you were going to see and the like. Everyone from people on the equestrian team to the top political level. And, you know, th that's how it was done. And you were my teacher, so I love that. And I, I acknowledge that. And I love to go, you know, I go, every year I go to Esalen and give a workshop on this, and I love to acknowledge everybody about it. Uh, so a bit of an aside, but let me say those kinds of things. Uh, you, Jim Hickman, and Michael Murphy really are the pioneers in this field. Uh, but conflict resolution is hampered, if you will, by adversarial thinking. In other words, if you've got to find out that one side wins or one side is right and the other one is wrong, it isn't going to work for you. You've got to come from a, a place where both have to have an equal part in any ending of a conflict. And there's obviously going to be one who, in your personal view, you think is wrong, stupid, abuse in human rights, all those things that we put. But those kinds of views don't make a big difference. By blaming one side more than the other, you're not going to do much to resolve the conflict. Um, the only, within that basis, the only way it's going to end is by total victory. Uh, World War II ended because there was a complete obliteration of the German side and you know it was done completely and totally but today no one seems to have the power to do that so we have to find ways to resolve conflict peacefully 
by interchange of ideas and the like, and that's not at all easy. Uh, so I'm rambling. Let me, what do you say? Maybe in a specific direction. That was also 56 million people died. So um, yeah, you know, at some point, I guess. Hmm. Yeah, that was not good that more. Right. Um, right. But I also, you know, I think about it. Um, it it's these roots that we, it, you know, the roots of that antagonism that you talk about, that, that those deep roots that, that whether they're, you're betting on, you know, you've got bets, but you've got these deep roots of stories. Because even if you go to World War II, and think about Woodrow Wilson, you know, are you know being so um, set on on punishing Ger Germany so badly? Does that even there? Does that then become a ricochet that becomes something later? You know, these roots go so deep. Um, and Ukraine is a place where uh, I forgot the number, but it's some enormous number of people have died. It is a bloodbath. That whole area has been a bloodbath. So, you know, where do we, how do we note smoke before there's a fire, you know, at, and, and, and maybe that just starts with pieces of value, you know, communicating as a value, getting out of stories that separate into stories that unite. Um, I love, you know, we, we all know that stories are the most powerful thing to changing a mind. Um, and the warmongers and the military are using them with far more money and, and much more effect than um, we. And I, I, I think what, John, you, you, know, you, it, you bring us back to the place of it is us, you know, that each of us has this role to take people, to help people out of the propaganda, to help people into not winning and losing, but the the understanding of the violence and how to come to that space of reconciliation and usefulness of peace, which isn't to separate it. At Code Pink, we say we're disarming um, because we never we never make it like someone's bad or good or that we're trying to get to victory, but could we disarm this, this moment um, to continue the disarming of um, the militaries? Thank you so much for, um, helping us see more deeply into, you know, where work, where the work is. You know, I, I want to underscore a point that you just made, uh, both Jody and, and John, about from my own experience uh, in the Soviet Union during those days of uh, when Gorbachev uh, came and, and so forth, uh, to underscore the intensely personal and human dimension of, I would say, diplomacy generally, uh, but uh, citizen diplomacy uh, in particular. Uh, almost all great peacemakers have been intensely personal in their capacity uh, to uh, humanize the relationship and soften the contours of the conflict. And um, I know uh, when uh, Jim Hickman and and John and Mark and I were going over to Moscow all the time, and we had apartments over there, and we were dealing with various things. And my particular specialty, as it turned out, was with the Central Committee and the Politburo, and eventually uh, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. I think looking back, it was our capacity and willingness to be empathetic with the, with the Russians that was the key to the softening on their side that allowed what we called hot tub diplomacy. And I, I'd like to give a kind of an example or two of this because I think it, it's important to also underscore that diplomacy oftentimes isn't some big, I bring peace, but rather doing something as simple uh, as uh, having dinner. You know, when we were over during the Soviet uh, days, even though there wasn't a hot war with the Soviets, if you were working for the U.S. Embassy, it was against protocol to have any contact with the Soviet. 
officials that wasn't pre-approved back in Washington by both, you know, the State Department and the CIA. You had to have briefings. You then had to arrange a meeting. The meeting was very official and it was in a, like a neutral location and you would meet and there would be an exchange of basically this our position and your position. The meeting would close. You'd go your separate ways. And then the American would report back uh, uh, through embassy channels uh, to the State Department, and there would be a dissecting of of the the protocols, and then the next meeting would happen. So most of the American personnel in Moscow were sitting there in the embassy (laughs) or back in their apartments, in the apartments. Everybody lived together in the apartments and so forth and so on, and there there was no contact. Well, we came over without any of those strictures. And what we discovered, as John, you'll remember, is that, you know, even if you were talking with high officials, they were they weren't doing much either because they were in the same stricture. So this these Americans were at first curiosities. And we were invited to their dachas. And as Jim was pointing out uh, uh, on Monday, you know, there was uh, much libation. There's a lot of vodka that flowed and caviar and late evenings and and you know till two or three o'clock in the mornings and then you'd go and then the next day or two you'd go over to Spasso House which was the official residence of the U.S. ambassador or to the embassy and they would say you met with Vadim Zagladin on the on the on the Politburo you had dinner with him are you kidding me what did he say and what was going on and well, we were just kind of drinking together and he was telling me about his family and he, you know, I was telling him about my, you know, so forth and so on. And there was very little politics that was going on, but there was a deep humanization of the enemy, as it were. And out of that came, came trust. And then some incidences would happen that and I'd like to tell one story because it's it, it was so poignant for me. In 1991, during the coup that happened against Gorbachev in June of 1991, uh, 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 remember when he was at, down at his dacha and there was an attempted coup and Yeltsin got up in the tank and so forth and so on, mm-hmm. Soviet Union began to break apart because Yeltsin was orchestrating a coup and he knew he couldn't take on Gorbachev directly so what he did as president of Russia is he got together with the president of Ukraine and the president of Belarus and in December they eventually seceded that as this process was taking place the Soviet Union began to break up I had had a lot of work with uh, uh, Edward Shevardnadze and he was the foreign minister he resigned in December of uh, 1990 warning of this coming coup and I had gotten him to come to the United States and there was by that time in my re- my relationship with both the Soviets and the Americans I was then orchestrating more overtly political uh, interactions uh, but they were always within a human uh, context so anyway to get to the point of the story Shevardnadze who was again foreign minister Gorbachev had brought him back he contacted me and he said, Jim, the Soviet Union is going to fall apart, which I found kind of shocking. And he said, uh, the hospitals are no longer able to get supplies. Uh, We don't have syringes. We don't have anesthesia. We don't even have Band-Aids. Can you organize uh, uh, some airlifts? So I contacted, uh, uh, who was by then uh, former Secretary of State George Schultz, who contacted Jim Baker, who was the Secretary of State at that point, and we began to organize uh, what we called the Russian uh, winter campaign to bring uh, big plane loads of, uh, of, of humanitarian supplies to Moscow. And And I would add what Jim said at the end of his comments, the the luxury of being a citizen diplomat is you can have a lot of fun. So I had the idea, well, why don't we invite a, the, the, the Soviets to send over an Antonov 
124, which at the time was the largest aircraft in the world, bigger than the 747s. And we'll get a, uh, the Air Force, US Air Force, to, to send over a, a Galaxy C5A. And they'll all leave together from Andrews Air Force Base. And Jim Baker was there, and there was a bunch of Soviet, and it was a beautiful thing. And I was in the Antonov C5As inhaling uh, petrol for about 24 hours before it finally came to Moscow because it was so big, it had to keep landing to take on more fuel. So anyway, we get to Moscow. And um, Alexander Yakovlev was there, who was the head of the Politburo. Uh, and um, we'd gotten out of the airplanes. They both landed together. And, and he uh, said to me, Jim, this is amazing. We'd like to have you say something. And on an instinct, I said, no, uh, I think it's better because uh, I really don't have any standing here. Why don't we ask the pilot of the Galaxy C5A to speak to the press. And uh, I just did it on an intuition, never having met the guy, because I was in the Antonov as we were flying over. And so I went over to the pilot and, and introduced myself. And I said, would you like to, 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 to um, uh, speak? Because we, we would be honored if you would say something. Turns out he was a four-star general who had asked special permission to fly the Galaxy 5A. And he gets up to the podium with all this press there. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, all my life, I've practiced flying to Moscow, carrying thermonuclear bombs, because I thought that was the only way I was gonna fly into your country, into your airspace, and here I am as a four-star general bringing humanitarian relief. And he started to cry. And it was one of those moments in time where through a series of innocent, altruistic actions, but done with an authenticity of human relationship that both the world stopped for a moment, but the world also moved, and it was an extraordinary thing, and it was covered extensively in the media, and it was out of that incident, actually, that I was invited to meet Gorbachev, because Yakovlev said to me, Garrison, you got to tell Gorbachev this story. <laughs> and it was, it was, so I said, sure, never even imagined that this little guy who has no standing on anything would would somehow through a twist of fate would be able to uh, be uh, instrumental in something that would get the attention of Gorbachev. And that, as they say, uh, the rest, as they say, was history in terms of the, uh, the, the relationship that I proceeded to have and the work that we did uh, through the State of the World Forum and so forth. But it's an example that I think both you, Jody, and I remember, you know, your story of, of trying to get Obama not to bomb Syria and you just handing a document uh, to a congressional guy that happens to be going over to the White House and through synchronicities. That's the beauty of, I think, citizen diplomacy is it's built not on official policy, but on synchronicities that somehow open up through the sincerity of the heart. So, I mean, we'd love to have John, you comment, and, and Jody, you comment on that, because I think that's the essence of citizen diplomacy, at least as I've experienced it in my own life and work. But it's also showing up from the heart. Um, mm -hmm. You know, that it's like that willingness to step out of these structures yeah. that are built that you described and be human together. And then when we're human together, that's when the magic happens, because it's life you know, wanting to support life. You also, you know, that story is also about how everyone, wars are created by people and the people in the war, those functionaries don't really want to be doing what they're doing. And one of the things I worry about is when this war ends, the people in Ukraine who, and, you know, Russia, who learn 
what was really happening, you know, because you're inside a story. And as that story unravels and you find out how you were being used and um, abandoned and, you know, all the things that happens when you're used in war, more soldiers in the United States, four times more soldiers have died in the United States from suicide than from uh, fighting in Iraq. Um, so when you find out the lies behind the story that you thought was driving you and to, you know, think that at the root of people engaging in war, that thing that they're used by, that story they're used by takes a good piece of them. It's, it locks into their heart. And you, un you unlocked that and gave something more beautiful for that general to do. That is, that is it. That is a story you need to tell a lot. Um, and that reminds everyone listening is that, that it's engagement. It's because you showed up and you showed up and you showed up that you build that pencil strength, that tuning fork that can shift. And I think that's, you know, the story you've told is the story this whole week has been about. How do we all become of that? You know, how do we show up for the smoke before it's fire? Um, because John and Mark have said, you know, as we say, you know, once a war started, it's so hard to end. Um, and that ha that's, that's globally and locally um, to take that lesson locally where we have too many struggles going on right now. Beautiful, thank you. I agree with everything you said, Jim. You need to make those personal connections. And once you make it, all sorts of new possibilities open up. And my experience has been the unanticipated, the unexpected is usually as interesting or more interesting as the stuff you wanted to do. In other words, opportunities arise out of where you are. Uh, Napoleon said, on s'engage puis on bois. One becomes engaged and then you see what the possibilities are. And without that at level of engagement, uh, almost nothing is going to happen. And when you were talking about the official diplomats who were not able really to see their uh, Soviet counterparts because of bureaucratic restrictions or security restrictions, um, that's why so much of official diplomacy doesn't work. And unfortunately, it's gotten worse in recent years because of the overemphasis or the emphasis on security. In other words, diplomats are in most countries of the American diplomats at least are not allowed to go out to restaurants and have mm -hmm. a, a, or to somebody's apartment and have a casual dinner. They have to clear in advance. They have to take security with them. And that isn't a good way to make to meet people, let's just say. So the kinds of connections that you and other people who were citizen diplomacies in the Soviet Union are not happening for the most part on the official level. Now, some people get past that, but for the most part, they're not happening. And that's one of the problems with official diplomacy. And if you take the great uh, success of the last probably eight or nine years was the Iran um, US JCPOA, the uh, treaty between the two countries. And really, it seems to me that occurred because John Kerry personally threw himself into it with uh, Zarif, the Iranian foreign ministry. They became friends, they talked about their children and their grandchildren, and they connected in a way that made an agreement possible. And probably if it had stayed on the level of official interaction, it never would have happened. Now, unfortunately, the whole thing got dismantled by the last administration, but it was a huge success, a real diplomatic breakthrough. And then as often happens, there was a break backwards. Yeah, and that's worth noting in that case of the Iranian nuclear deal, uh, that uh, Kerry and Zarif brokered, it was Putin coming in uh, sort of at the last moment uh, to support Obama uh, that kind of sealed the deal. So it was another example, as you were mentioning earlier, John, where 
uh, uh, you know, uh, the superpowers, when the superpowers get aligned as, you know, it'd be an extraordinary thing if the United States would say to the world, yeah, you know, China has actually a good idea. That would change everything. Mm -hmm. And it would elevate the U.S. to a peacemaker. It would it would diffuse the conflict with China immeasurably because we would be cooperating on the most critical issue in the world today and escalating potentially nuclear uh, weapons conflict uh, in Europe. Um, and uh, and that's what happened with the Iranian, where it was one of those moments where the world came together at the at all levels. Something important was taking place. But then, as you say, it was uh, uh, deconstructed when Trump came into, into office and hasn't been reconstituted. And therefore, the situation over there in the Middle East is even more dangerous. And Iran now is siding with Russia and China. Uh, so that's another aspect of unintended consequences as peace uh, un unravels. Um, and this leads me to the final point that I'd like to just tease out because I think it's, it's in the end, for me, it's, it's sort of in some ways the highest virtue. And that is perseverance. You can't give up keeping on, keeping on, because the synchronicities disappear and the opportunities evaporate. If you don't maintain, as we did during the citizen diplomacy era with the Soviets, you keep on and you keep on and you keep on. You don't take no for an answer. Every impossibility that you encounter is an opportunity for the miraculous. And I know Jody Evans, you are exhibit A with what you've done with Code Pink. I mean, I can't tell you how many people in Jody's told me about Code Pink have been arrested 20, 30, 40, 100 times like Medea, and they just keep on keeping on. So John, first, just talk to us about the importance of perseverance and some of the peacemaking that you've done. And then Jody, uh, give us a final word. John. Well, it I totally agree with that. Um, I mean, Woody Allen, before he was discredited tremendously, said that 80% of success is showing up. And you mm -hmm. need to keep showing up if you want to do the kind of work that Jim is describing. It just can't be done casually. I can't tell you how many people have come to me over the years and said, I'm really successful psychologist in, in bringing people together in Northern California. Take me to the Middle East. I can help make peace. And the answer is that isn't so. You need to be thoroughly rooted in the culture, in what's going on. It's not something that can be done casually from a parachuting point of view. It needs a complete commitment and the like. And um, so, I mean, you know, I, Jim is one of my teachers and I learned it from him. Thank you, John. Jody, well, tell us about perseverance. <laughs> well, you're the one with perseverance. Here you are, you know, all these years building, you know, understanding what has to happen, which does start with our consciousness, understanding about stories, understanding about connecting people, hearing people's stories, connecting their wisdom because it has been deeply won and something that has come out of that perseverance and showing up. So uh, Jim, it's like, yes, perseverance. That's what we saw this week at the Goldman Prize. All those people who had actually done something to save the planet. It was not decades, it was four decades. It was, you know, showing up, learning, showing up, iterating, learning, turning around um, and also it's love. You know, I think that the perseverance comes from the love, that there's something that we've fallen in love with, humanity and, and the desire for it to have a future that creates that um, per perseverance. And also I think in each case, it's that you show up and it defines you too. Yeah, you're created in the showing up and then because what you learn creates then what you want to offer next. 
which takes us to you know why why we have these mornings why you join us on these mornings is so that you can have the wisdom the understanding the peeling back of the barnacles of propaganda into having your own heart having your own consciousness un unleashed from being in the pitting being in the the ring of the fight um and instead of being in the place of how do we together help others be liberated from the propaganda? Because just that is the start. As we start to tell people other stories, not to be right, but to open a conversation. Um, and in that conversation to find our place to truth, which is liberation. Um, and so I, you know, the truth will set you free. And then um, from that space of freedom and love is where your next act come from. But sharing stories, speaking, I mean, just being out there talking about something in a different way than what people are getting in the mainstream media and, you know, or turning the television off and putting the newspaper away and being in relationship locally, being peace. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, John. If I could just add one word I, that for me is the heart of perseverance as I've experienced it. I think it comes out of a deep love, a love of humanity, a love of what's possible uh, for the world, uh, a love for the person that you're speaking with. Uh, so I think perseverance for me uh, is an is in service all the time for a deepening love uh, born out of the fragility of our situation and knowing, as you just said, Jody, that somehow you've got to get in the arena and make whatever difference that you can. And that's what gives you the strength to keep on keeping on. And John, you and Susan have, have been keeping on, keeping on for decades as you have, Jody. So I just want to celebrate the both of you and also Mark and everyone else who's uh, showing up for peace uh, because they love so deeply. And that'll bring us to a close, everyone. This has been a marvelous uh, session. Uh, thank you all for joining. You can join the after session chat. You'll see the link in the chat box. And we'll see you tomorrow. Uh, for our fifth and final session. And we're going to have that with Larry Wilkerson, uh, who will be joining us uh, out of a deep, deep experience uh, in the U.S. military. Thanks, everyone. That'll do it to, for us for today. Bye for Thanks, now. Jim. Thanks, John. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I Beautiful. appreciate the opportunity. Thanks.